You are listening to the Fly the W670 podcast. It's season two. It's episode 54. Cubs nail down the Nats. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and most importantly, subscribe to our podcast. Follow us on the socials. Fly the W670 on Twitter and Instagram. And of course, you can follow us on Facebook as well or email us. Fly the W670 at gmail.com. Crowley, happy Thursday and uh, happy uh, Cardinals weekend. Yeah, it's a big weekend. The Pat Hughes Hall of Fame induction, Cardinals. Uh, you know, it's it's, it's going to be a fun time at the old ballpark this weekend. Absolutely. And the Cubs got the series against the Nationals. Didn't sweep like I had hoped and predicted, but did take two out of three, as you predicted. Let's uh, get it going with the uh, Cubs recap against the Nationals. Game number one, Drew Smiley on the bump for the opener. Yeah, Drew Smiley versus Mackenzie Gore. The Cubs lost this one 7-5, to five, and Cubs Nation, uh, they just were feeling pretty down after that Boston series, and then you lose to the Nets. And, you know, Drew Smiley's struggles continue. He at least was able to give manager David Ross some length, right? He went six innings, but he gave up five runs on eight hits with seven Ks. Former Cub Heimer Candelario hit a two-run homer in the first, and the Cubs are down 2 nothing before they even have a chance to hit, you know? <laughs> That was a terrible way to start. Not to mention Crowley, not to mention you got two strikes on the leadoff hitter who you then plunk. Okay. Not on purpose. I'm guessing, but then, then, then you get the guy in a rundown and you can't execute the rundown. You had him pegged, you had him pegged and they couldn't execute it. So there shouldn't have been a guy on in the first place. And then that home run is basket aided. Yeah. The Cubs have had plenty of those benefit them, but you know, those baskets, boy, oh boy. It, and, 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 and that was Trey Mancini who, who just really didn't do the execute the rundown really well. So no, he could, doesn't have his legs underneath him. Still, his legs are still an issue. Really nice guy wanted him here, felt it made all the sense in the world, but for whatever reason, he has not been able to get his legs underneath him. No. And during the broadcast, they talked about how smiley wanted to be more aggressive, but with the free swing and nationals team, I don't know if that's the best approach. And then Ross went with uh, Daniel Palencia on the seventh, but he struggled. He gave up two runs on three hits. That didn't make much sense either. No. Right? No. I mean, why don't you go to Leiter Jr. there? No idea. And so here's the thing, Dustin. If the Cubs are going to go on any sustained run, they need Smiley to snap out of it. He has a 7.62 ERA in his last six starts after beginning the season with a 327 ERA across his first three, 13 starts. So for 13 starts, he looked really good, kind of what you expected. But I mean, this is these last six starts have just been a disaster. Awful. Not even, I don't you know, awful, disaster, terrible, you know, just bad. Don't know what it is, but, you know, and, and then, you know, make matters worse. The offense struggled versus Mackenzie Gore. Christopher Morrell hit an RBI single to make it 2-1 to one in the second. But the offense uh, did come to life a little bit in the second half of the game, and this is going to be important when we talk about the series because you you finally saw some life from these guys. In the bottom of the sixth, Ian Happ hit a two-run homer, and in the bottom of the seventh, Patrick Wisdom hit a two-run homer. For Happ, it was his first home run off a left-handed pitcher this season and his first extra base hit since June 24th in London against the Cardinals. So you can see the struggles that Hap has had batting right-handed. It's just absolutely been tough. And to not have any extra bases since the London series, that's too, That's like your cleanup hitter. All right, that's crazy when you think about that that, that, that it's been that long for an extra base hit for a guy batting third or fourth every day in your lineup. Right. And wisdom has not, he had, that was his second home run in the last three games after snapping a 17 game 45 at bat homerless stretch dating to May 29th, as it is now July 20th. He was injured for a while down seven to five in the eighth. The Cubs had runners at second and third with two outs for Mike Talkman. He hits a laser to center fielder. Alex called to end the threat. You know, it just sometimes, like I said, just feels like the breaks have not gone the Cubs way that, that, looked like it was going to maybe tie the game up. Yep, it looked like that one was going to get down. Mm -hmm. And the offense scored five runs on nine hits, but they left six men on base and were one for six with runners in scoring position. But when you look at this game, Dustin, right here, uh, they were two for – when you take a look, there's three guys I'm looking at here that have been the issue in July when you look at the offense, and that is Horner, Suzuki, and Happ. Okay. Now, Hap and Suzuki have kind of been, you know, Hap struggled all season and Suzuki's been inconsistent. In this game, 
they were two for 14. Suzuki got a hit and he was along for the ride that Hap hit the home run. But get this, Dustin, since coming back from London, Hap, Horner, and Suzuki are collectively slashing 189, 284, 254 with two home runs and 56 strikeouts. That's not going to get it done, Crowley. Not even close. I mean, you, you can't do that and hope to have any sustained success. And this is, you put Dansby Swanson in that mix, that's the new core. That is right. the new everyday core. Hap, Horner, Suzuki, and Dansby Swanson. And we can leave Dansby out of it right now because he's been hurt for quite a while. But that is not that is not going to get it done. No. Horner's average this month has dropped to 267. Suzuki's is down to 250. And Ian Hap's at 245. So, you know, right now, in the last 30 days, Hap is hitting 187. So right now, Trey Mancini, Jan Gomes, and Mike Talkman are all hitting better than your third or fourth batter in your lineup on an everyday basis. Yeah, and I don't know where this team would be without Mike Talkman. We're going to keep talking about him through the rest of these games against the Nationals. Yeah, and, you know, and when we get to game two, you got Jamison Tyone versus Patrick Corbin. Now I'm sitting there. I, 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 at the last minute, I got lucky, and I ended up getting upgraded to the barrel room. All-inclusive, all you could eat, all you could drink. Now, how does and that so, happen? Now, t- t- uh, take, a, take us through Take us through that little look behind the curtain there, Crowley. How, well, how does a Crowley get invited <laughs> to the barrel room? I don't know. You don't yes. seem like the barrel. You don't really seem like the barrel room type. It, it's it's you know what it, it's free, so I'm not going to complain on the food and drinks. It's it's nice seats, and so uh, you know my buddy is one of the bartenders there, so I get to see him, Jimmy. If you ever in the barrel room, look for Jimmy. Tell him you know Crawley. But you know I just had a friend that just had somebody who couldn't make it, and and I I came in off the bullpen, so. You know, you know that Jamison Tyone is starting, so I'm already hitting the whiskey early, and <laughs> uh, you know, and, and sure Jameson, enough, as, yeah. oh yeah, a little JMO while JMO's pitching, and sure enough, we're settling into our seats. The second batter of the game, Lane Thomas, hits a home run, and I start drinking a little bit harder. The Cubs are down one to nothing before they had a chance to bat again. They're down before they have a chance to bat. Then in the second, Tyone gave up a two-run single to Lane Thomas to make it three to nothing. But then Dustin, a funny thing happened. Tyone settled down. Didn't give up any more runs. He went 5.2 innings, gave up three runs on seven hits, four Ks, and one walk. Yeah, that's okay. Like you could you could live with that if that's what he does day in and day out. I don't think it's worth $78 million, but you could live with that. Absolutely. But the real story of this game was the offense. I talked I talked about the that game, uh, the previous game, game one. All of a sudden you started, you know, wisdom's hitting home runs and hap. You guys are starting to kind of make a run. They just didn't have enough. But all of a sudden, the offense exploded for 17 unanswered runs that began with a Jan Gomes sack fly in the fourth. They scored two in the sixth with the Seiya Suzuki solo home run and a Cody Bellinger RBI single to tie the game. Then the Cubs scored six runs in the seventh and eight runs in the eighth. Who was- would have ever have predicted that? <laughs> ever. And as somebody enjoying the free drinks for the longer games, I was having a blast. Yeah. It was it was the first time since May 5th, 2001, that the Cubs scored at least six runs in back-to-back innings and just the 11th time in franchise history. Nico, three for six with two RBIs. Seiya, four for six with three RBIs. Hap, two for three with an RBI. Belly, two for four. He's had multiple hits in five of the six games since the All-Star break and is hitting 435 since the break. Amaya, two for five with three RBIs. Wisdom, two for four with another home run. And Miles Mastroboni, everyone's favorite punching bag. He reached base all five times with three hits and two walks. Yeah, that will never happen again. What, what It was just an amazing game. I had so much fun. And like I said, you know, when you get those all-inclusive seats, the worst thing is a pitcher's duel that goes two hours. When right. you get a game like this where it's rocking and pitching changes – it, oh boy, it was a, it, it was a fun night. All right, so keep keep telling us. So you 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 told us about the drinks. Now tell us about the eats before we get to game three. Oh yeah, you get buffet. You, you know Garrett's popcorn, Cracker Jacks. You you grab whatever you want. It, it it's great. The vibe in there is like very kind of like old school. They make it like a speakeasy. The seats are cushioned seats. The uh the vendors come around. You don't pay for anything, man. It's just living. So where where are these seats exactly? Are they like the barrel room they... is on the right field side? So it's like the first. Uh, I was in row five, uh, uh, right around, kind of in between first and right field. Okay, so it's it's back in the corner then. Yeah, it, okay. it, it's yeah. Okay. So it, that's on the right field side, 
And then the Catalina Club, I want to say, is behind home plate, but like upper behind where the underneath the press box. And then they have the I think it's the W Club on the left field side, and then the 1914s right behind home plate. Yeah, haven't been haven't been in any of them. I've been to two out of the four, so they're they're always fun if you can get them. All right, absolutely. All right, that takes us to game three, Crowley. So it's evened up a game apiece, and Kyle Hendricks is throwing for us. Yeah, Kyle Hendricks, Trevor Williams. I don't know if you had a chance. Did you get a chance to talk to I recognize him. I recognize Trevor Williams now after you reminded me who he was. I was looking for his dad. They never showed him on Marquee. Never Lowe. showed him. Did, did Tommy ever answer on the Mully and Haw show why they kind of separated him and, Am- and Amaya? Because I'm just curious. Um, not exactly. Um, they, want their, they want their pitchers and catchers all to be able to work with one another. Um, nothing against Amaya, but they just liked, uh, they just liked the idea of getting, of getting those two together. I believe that they're trying to showcase, uh, Tucker Barnhart. And that was the reason, uh, why. And then he also used that, as you mentioned in game number two, Amaya two for five with three RBI. And he was doing that from catching. He wasn't the DH. So he caught the night before. So not back to back nights. Um, but that's, that's what he said was, uh, that's what he said was up. Okay, so after two bad starts in a row, the Cubs needed Hendricks to come through, and he did great. He went six innings pitch. He gave up five hits, one run. He struck out five and walked zero batters. That was such a difference because I was at the last game that he started against Boston where they were taking batting practice on him. Uh, The only run Kyle gave up was uh, courtesy of, you know, there was a regular single and then two cheap infield singles that, like, literally were like squibbers down the line. And so that's the only run he gave up. And so it was good to not see any hard contact against him. So great by Kyle offensively. And, and you talked about this earlier. The game started out as the Mike Talkman show. Mike the, Talkman game, the Palatine Pounder. Yes, sir. He leads off the game with a home run, had an RBI double in the fourth, and had an RBI double in the seventh. He was thrown out trying to reach third. It was a very close Javi esque t- uh, uh, tried to tag in. He didn't yeah, make it. You can't, you can't make that first out. You, know, you don't want to <laughs> make the last out at third. You also don't want to make the first out at third. Right, but basically the score was Mike Talkman three, the Nationals one. Yeah, exactly, exactly what it was. But uh, Mark Leiter was the first out of the pen in the seventh. Oh, seven. look pitched. at that. Mark Leiter, He's first out of the pen. Okay. First out of the pen. He goes two-thirds of an inning, but he kind of struggled a little bit. And Merriweather came in. He got the final out. But then Merriweather came out in the eighth, gave up a home run to former Cub Heimer Candelario, and Washington would tie it up on an RBI single by Luis Garcia. But right, in- hold on, hold on. I got to stop you there. Yes, we got we got to talk about David Ross again here. Okay, so Merriweather came in in relief a lighter, and that's yes. what he's used to doing. Merriweather, he comes in messy situations, potentially base runners on base, high leverage situation most of the time, and he did his job. He got them out of the inning. I don't know that Merriweather usually comes in to start a clean inning. That's mm-hmm. not usually what he does. So at that point. Why didn't you go to somebody else? At that point, why don't you go to somebody who's used to that setup? I don't think that's usually Merriweather setup. Now, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I mean, here's the baseball. Go get the guy out. But clearly, clearly, uh, Major League Baseball bullpen guys have like minds like NFL wide receivers. And that's not a compliment. Like they, they have to be everything has to be just right for them to do their job. Right. And my guess would just be David saw, you know, Merriweather do what he had to do. He was already warmed up and let him roll again, but it just didn't play out this time, unfortunately. It did not. It did not. But in the bottom of the eighth, game is tied. The Cubs would load the bases with no outs. Jan Gomes had a pinch hit sack fly, clutch as always, to make it four to three. Now that's somewhere where I want to compliment David Ross. Okay. We take enough shots at the guy, want to compliment him. He, you know, feel. That to me, that was a feel thing. To me, that had nothing to do with uh, strat- stats and stratomatics and big blue and anything else. He knows that Gomes has been clutch all year. Big moment. Let's see what he's got on his birthday. And and he came through with that with that sack fly. And then you know we talk about Mike Talkman. It's the quality of at bats that he gives you. This was a two out walk with the bases loaded. And that allowed Nico Horner to come to plate. He will hit his first career grand slam to put the game away as the Cubs would win eight for three. 
The offense scored eight runs on 11 hits and went four for nine with runners in scoring position. Like I said, the Mike Talkman game, three for four with three RBIs and that two out walk to load the bases to set up Nico's grand slam. Nico was two for five with four RBIs. Bellinger two for four. Say it two for three. And Miles Masterboni went two for four. So the Cubs, Dustin, needed this series badly. Now, if Horner and Suzuki are busting out like it looks like they might be, you know, it, 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 it is at a crucial time because this is supposedly the weakest part of their schedule. And you talk about complimenting David Ross. Supposedly, David Ross saw something that Saya was doing in the box um, as far as his head movement. And that that's something that, that they're working on. So hopefully they get those guys. But, you know, two guys, Ian Happ and Drew Smiley, need to figure it out ASAP because guess what? Guess who's coming back from the dead? The Cardinals. The Yes, sir. We're going to talk about them a little bit more in a few minutes. We're also going to talk about Drew Smiley's future a little bit more in a few minutes. This is the Fly the W670 podcast. It's season two. It's episode 54. The Cubs nail down the Nats. Don't forget to listen, download, review. Most importantly, subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. In this segment, Crawley interviews Cubs radio analyst on 670 The Score, former Cubs All-Star Ron Coomer, a just a great guy to talk about. His radio partner, Pat Hughes, his go- partner is going into the Hall of Fame this weekend, and a special radio program to honor Pat will be airing on the score on Friday from 6 until 9 on 670 to score. And, right, Coomer and Zach are joining Pat out in Cooperstown this weekend. Pat wanted to share the weekend with his radio partners. Joining me now on the fly of the W broadcast we have a very special guest you know him as the plate radio analyst on 670 the score ron coomer coom how are you doing i'm doing great how are things going oh i am i am so happy this is got this is such an exciting weekend for cub fans players past and present the organization and especially for you guys in the cubs broadcast team 28 years Pat Hughes is the radio broadcaster of the Cubs. That's more than half my life. He's finally going to be honored as the Ford Frick Award winner, recognizing excellent in broadcasting. How are you feeling right now about this, and when are you heading to Cooperstown? Well, I'm feeling great about it. I, you know, I know Pat's probably in a little different position than I am. He's probably grinding a little harder thinking about this speech he's got to give on Saturday, but we're all doing good. I, we're all very happy and proud of, you know, for Pat and happy for Pat and proud of him and, and all those things. So um, just looking forward to getting to Cooperstown. We are going to head, uh, Mitch Rosen and I and Zach Zaidman are going to head there on Friday with the Cubs, um, with Tom Ricketts and Crane Kenny and, and our group and Colin and uh, Faulkner. And we're all going to head to Cooperstown Friday. And there's a dinner Friday night. And I know Saturday is the induction Saturday, I think early afternoon. So just excited. It's my first time going to Cooperstown. I always wanted to wait until one of my friends went in, you know, and I had a couple that are in there, a couple teammates that are buddies and was unable to go when they got inducted. And now my partner going in and my buddy uh, going, going in, it's Pat and I uh, couldn't be happier to go and support him in this, uh, just a great, great moment for him and his family. Now, Coombe, you grew up in Chicago, and, and as you know, the Cubs have a long line of legendary broadcasters. If you go back to Vince Lloyd and Jack Quinlan and Lou Boudreau, Miles Hamilton, uh, Harry Carey, Lloyd Pettit. I mean, as someone who's listened to a lot of these broadcasts, what is it about Pat Hughes that makes him a Hall of Fame broadcaster? Well, you got to remember Jack Brickhouse, too, right? Jack, oh. was he's another Hall of Famer, right? That's uh, the guy that we kind of grew up listening to. I know I did as a kid. and he was part of the reason I became a broadcaster or even thought about it. Um, but I, what makes Pat a hall of famer? I, I just, there's a lot of things. It's not one thing. When you listen to Pat on the air, there's a, there's a comfort, right? And, and I'm not speaking from his partner. I'm speaking from the fan who's been listening to Pat for years, you know, as a Cub fan, right? I mean, I grew up a Cub fan and, and listening to Cubs games and watching Cubs games and, um, as I was playing, you know, in the big leagues, I would always try to find out how the Cubs are doing and listen to the broadcast. And um, if I was on the road somewhere at times and uh, and then when I became a Cub, we became friends. And so I think to answer your question, there's a few things. One, 
His voice is just tremendous on the air. Um, his pace of game and how he um, spells out what's happening, right, and, and paints the picture is um, as good as anybody in baseball. And and then I think there's a there's a thing that comes across on the air. I don't think I know it does. And there's a kindness to him to him and who he is and what he is and what he represents. That's good, right? And and wholesome, and that's our game. And that all comes across uh, on the air. And then as his partner, I, I I've never met a guy that's um, you know open to everybody being included. He's a very inclusive guy when it comes to airtime. Unlike a lot of broadcasters and play-by-play guys, he's very inclusive to everybody that's involved, and that's a special gift. And and you know he's. Well, well worthy of this honor, but there's a lot of reasons why he's a Hall of Famer. Now, as you kind of talked about, you know, Jack Brickhouse being a guy that, that made you want to be a broadcaster, you got that opportunity uh, with the Twins first off, and then you picked a good year to come over to the Cubs in uh, 2014. What was those first few broadcasts like with Pat, and how did he make the transition to the Cubs radio booth easier for you? Well, I can tell the story very quickly. He made it very easy, the transition. Uh, the broadcasting itself, not easy. The transition of coming over to the Cubs and being with him, uh, very easy. He, you know, he was just very welcoming and, and very friendly. And, and you know, we bonded right away. Uh, but, you know, trying to find a rhythm and fitting in with Pat, you know, and wanting to be a, a plus to the broadcast and, you know, him not having to carry me so much, you know, was something I was um, just – trying to figure out how that was going to be the case. Um, at the beginning, you know, I was following Keith Moreland was there for a few years, but Ronnie Sano who was a friend. Um, was there a long time and, you know, um, the Pat and Ron show once again. So it was one of those things that, you know, you're not going to replace Ron Sano, but Pat made it very easy. Um, he really did. And he's, as I said, he's a, he's a great friend and he has, he's been open on the air to, everybody being included. And, and I think that's, that's the one thing that when you're around Pat long enough, you, you see that there's very little ego and very much let's do a good broadcast and be prepared. And that's, that's him in a nutshell. You, you talked a little bit about, you know, you know, Pat's cadence and some of the, the stuff that makes him such a good broadcaster. And the funny thing about it is when you listen to Pat, he makes it look so easy, but he puts in a tremendous amount of work for every broadcast. What does an average game day look like for Pat? What do you see him do to prepare for broadcasts? Well, you know, when he gets to the ballpark, um, you know, basically all he does is he fills out his lineup card and does a little reading of the game notes like we all do. But his preparation starts, you know, first thing in the morning when he wakes up. I, you know, like for both of us, you get up in the morning and you make the, the, the morning coffee like everybody, but instantly you go right to – the news of the day in major league baseball and in your prepping. And then you're looking at the, you know, the opposing team and who's hot, who's not, what they're doing when they're coming in, you know, like we have the Cardinals coming in and hall of fame weekend. So, you know, you prep for the Cardinals and what they've done. And, and by the time Pat gets to the ballpark, there's nothing that's happened in major league baseball or with say, say this week in the Cubs and Cardinals that he's not aware of, or I'm not aware of. So I think, the preparation is uh, is not something that happens, you know, once you get to the ballpark. The preparation is something that's ongoing all day long, and that's the job, and that's what we love about the job. I, I got no problem op- opening my computer first thing in the morning with a cup of coffee and reading about what happened in Baltimore, New York, or L.A., and what's going to happen tonight in Chicago, and I think we're both in that, you know, we both feel that way, and that's what, you know, why we can play off each other so well because we both know you know what I know Pat read everything that's happened yesterday as I did so we're all you know we're kind of on the same page one of the things that you know I'm a big collector of Cubs memorabilia Ron and and I've bought two different scorecards one was the game seven scorecard one was the Kerry Wood 20k scorecard and I love those scorecards because you get to see Pat's notes that he has written on there and it's just kind of like a fun behind the scenes look you know what I mean Absolutely. You, you know, the, the thing about the card, everybody has their different ways of doing things. And a lot of guys use the computers solely now 
but I, I'm a scorebook person, and so is Pat, obviously. And his card, his score card is unique in that all of his notes for the game are on the card. And he, so he just has a little outline on the right side of his scorecard. And so you can follow along. If you watch, let's say, game seven and you have the scorecard, you can see where we've checked off the box of some of the things that we wanted to touch on throughout the game. Now, sometimes we get to most of them and we both understand, you know, the game's 10 to 2. You, you get a lot of free time to talk about a lot of things. <laughs> um, when it's a really good game or game seven of the World Series, um, the, the conversation stuck right to the ball game. That was um, something that, you know, you're, you're, there's not a lot of extra stuff other than just what's happening when it comes to game seven. Now, Pat's called a lot of legendary games in Cubs history, the Kerrywood 20K game, the Sosa, Sosa McGuire home run chase, the Brant Brown, Brown drop ball, you know, no hitters, postseason games. And like we were just talking about the 2016 World Series, you had a front row to many of these calls. Is there any one that kind of stands out to you or that gives you goosebumps? Well, I, I think first and foremost, game seven, you have to go there. You know, when you're talking about Cubs baseball, there, you know, in our lifetime, and we haven't had a game seven, right? We never had one. And to do game seven sitting next to him um, was special. The whole day was special, leading up to the ball game and trying to get prepared for it. And, you know, we get to the ballpark in the World Series so early. You know, I think we were at the ballpark at 1230 or quarter to one. We didn't play till eight o'clock on the East Coast. So you get a lot of time. Uh, and a lot of prep time, and, and there's just only so much you can prep for, and then you just got to play the game. And uh, But I, I know the feeling that we both had, along with Mitch Rosen, our, our executive producer, in the booth, the three of us, um, you know, let's say that five minutes before game time, man, that's, a, that's an energy unlike anything else. And uh, that was fun. But, you know, once the game started, it was, here's Pat. It's the old, whoa, here we go, you know, just the, the constant, you know, way of calling the game. And um, that, that to me is the game. When I watch it again, still on marquee or, or hear it on our station with the score, I'm just instantly, it brings me right back to that moment. You know, I, as you know, I go, I'm a season ticket holder. I go to a ton of games, so I don't always get to hear the broadcast, but what I do usually is the next day I'll listen to it. They have them archived um, in the MLB app. And to me, the, the, the moment when they clinched versus the Cardinals in 2015, the NLDS, was it that one or was it the 2016? I can't remember. But there's a line where Pat says, I wish you could all be here right now. And that one to me always kind of really, really kind of gives, you know, gives me goosebumps, gets the hair on my back of my neck up. Um, Pat's been up for the Ford Frick Award a few times before, and he didn't get in. There has to be a feeling of disappointment when that call doesn't come. How nervous were you this year when it came time for that call, or were you confident that this year was going to be the year? I thought he had a good chance this year. I really did. I, I We all had a pretty good feeling. Um, I can't speak for Pat, but I think the rest of us, you know, Mitch Rosen and I and Crane Kenny and the Cubs people, probably Tom Ricketts and Colin Faulkner. I think we all had a pretty good feeling about it, but I know, you know, just from being friends with a lot of the people in major league baseball, I know that there's other great candidates. If you're on that list, you know, Tom Hamilton, for instance, from Cleveland, who called game seven of the world series in the booth next to us, another great candidate who did not get in and Pat did. And you talk about two of the best in our game right now, you, you know, you, who do you give it to? Right. So, um, there were a lot of great guys on that, um, on that list. I was just really happy Pat got in. Um, we were sitting here by our phones waiting to get the, the, the news that he got in. So we were all waiting and then we shot right over to his house to, uh, congratulate him and to celebrate with him. But you know, you wait, you, you wonder, is it going to happen? And, and it did for him. Well, you know, l let's talk about it because we are going to celebrate this weekend. It's Hall of Fame weekend. It's here. And to honor the legacy of Pat Hughes, 670 The Score will be airing an audio retrospective of Pat's career. It's called Pat's Call to the Hall this Friday, July 21st from 6 to 9 p.m. And it's going to be hosted by you and Zach Zaidman. Could you tell our listeners what they can expect when they listen into this broadcast? Well, it's, it's going to be a, a who's who of baseball people from players, ex-players, 
um, Hall of Fame broadcasters and broadcasters and friends, right, that have all been around uh, baseball for a very long time. And, you know, it's the who's who of baseball. When you're talking about who we've been able to talk to, I know I've had a great chance and a lot of fun to talk to some of the greats in our game that I get to see sometimes fairly regular because they're broadcasting you know, for another team, you know, against the Cubs. And then some guys we don't get to see all that often, but um, they were all very open to, you know, talking about Pat. And um, so you're going to get the, you know, from the Bob Costases and, you know, some of the other people there, just just a boatload of guys that are um, very happy for Pat and very open to, uh, to talk about, um, you know, him going into the hall. A lot of the guys, as we've taped some of this stuff, they're going to be there with us. So it's going to be fun when we get to get to Cooperstown. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at the list of, of some of these names, Joe Madden, David Ross, Bob Costas, and, and one of the great cup fans that all Chicago fans know Eddie Vedder. I mean, that that's an all-star lineup, Coom. Yeah, it's, it's very good. I'm, I'm very happy that, you know, it was just fun. It's fun for me to be able to do that and, and just be the part of the, um, just, just, part of interviewing and talking about, about, you know, Pat and his role and, and some of the things that he's done with some of the greats in our game, you know, that have called it as well as anybody. So it's, it's, it was really fun. Not only that, um, the, the score 670, the score will also air Pat's induction speech on July 22nd. That's a Saturday following the broadcast of the Cubs Cardinals game. And if you didn't catch Pat's call to the hall on Friday, it will air again after Pat's speech, Coom, I appreciate you taking some time out of your very busy day to talk about this, but this is going to be a fun one for Cub fans and no one better than you to, to really kind of tell us about Pat because you guys share a special bond and that comes through on the radio broadcast. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me on and I know I'll see you here at the ballpark real soon. So always good to talk to you. We, you know, we've had a lot of fun together. So thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Coom. You take care. Bye-bye. All right. We're good, my friend. Thank you so much for hopping on. Yep. Good deal. See you, Kraut. This is the Fly the W670 podcast. Crawley, great job with Coomer. It's season two. It's episode 54. Cubs, nail down the Nats. Don't forget to download, like, and subscribe to the podcast. So, Crawley, we got some news. We got some notes. We got the hot. We got the not. And we got the Cardinals coming in for not a three-game series, but Crawley's favorite, a four-game series. Thumbs down for those of you not watching on the 670 Score YouTube channel. Um, Some good news, though. The Cubs have agreed to terms with 10 more players from the draft, including their third and fourth round picks. They've signed nine out of their 10 first round selections and 17 of 20 overall. So Dan Kantrovitz and the crew are just doing a great job of making sure these guys get locked up. Now, speaking of draft picks, Matt Shaw was in Wrigley Field for the first time. I love seeing the kids, Dustin, when they're wearing the jerseys for the first time and they're sitting in the dugouts and they got the beat reporters. But he was asked. You got, how, a, you got a Bruce Levine sitting right next to you, right? Always, always, right? Uh-huh. And so he's sitting there and he was asked how quickly he wants to make it to Wrigley. And this was his answer. As much as I wish that was my decision, my internal timetable is to to fail with the best of them as soon as you can. So I kind of like this kid's moxie already. Yeah, good approach. Good, uh, good answer to a, uh, uh, you know, a trick kind of question, maybe. Right. So uh, we'd also want to congratulate Kyle Hendricks and his wife, Emma, um, on the announcement of their first child. So Kyle yes. and Emma expecting a, a baby professor, hopefully. So nice. Congratulations news. on that. Yeah. And now let's talk a little bit about uh, injuries and the roster at this point. So some good news. Nick Magical is running the bases and, you know, it looks like he could potentially even be back before Dansby Swanson. Uh, Dansby's continuing with the baseball activities. Also Nick's birdie. Remember he had that weird emergency app, uh, appendix surgery. He's back to throwing bullpens. So he's another guy that throws heat. Hopefully he can, uh, you know, come back quickly and help the Cubs out in the pen. All right, Crowley, let's take a look at the, uh, standings right now the Cubs uh winners of two out of three but you mentioned little tease that the uh, Cardinals have been red hot I believe they've won six in a row yep and uh, what you have to do is you have to I, I said they're like a horror villain that no matter how many times you stab them they will keep popping up 
Now, Milwaukee has been hot lately. They're 53 and 43, 7 and 3 at their last 10. Cincy falling back to earth, although there's a lot of rumors going on right now that Cincy is scouring for starting pitching, which is their weakness, including looking over at the south side of town and seeing what kicking the tires over there. The Reds have a stocked farm system, so you may see a deal between those two teams. Cincinnati is is, uh, three and seven in their last 10. They're in second place, 2.5 game back in Milwaukee. The Cubs, five games away from 500, so just trying to crawl back to that 500 mark. They're 500 right now in their last 10 at five and five. But the St. Louis Cardinals, the Cubs' upcoming opponent, 43 and 53, 10 games back, but they're eight and two in their last 10, winners of five straight. The the uh, the GM said we're sellers, and now the Cardinals are trying to, you know, do a little. I don't know if it's it's too little, too late, but look out. And now they're no longer in the basement. Pittsburgh occupies that spot, 42 and 54, 11 games back, two and eight in their last 10. That didn't take long as far as the Pirates, Crowley. A couple of oh, weeks ago, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, they were sitting up on top, right? They were feeling high. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, sure enough, you know, maybe who knows what'll happen. That's why you hope that the Cubs continue to play well and force Jed to kind of roll with this team and just see what happens. Um, and, and like I said, you know, you look and say, oh, this is the weak part of the schedule, but sometimes it, it matters when you catch these guys. If you play Pittsburgh in the first half, you're going to look bad. If you play Pittsburgh right. now, it looks like an easy part of your schedule. Yeah, Same thing with the point. Cardinals, you know, yeah, you, point. You, you look at the schedule like, oh, Washington and the car and the Cardinals, we should win a whole bunch, but Car- the Cardinals are playing good baseball right now. Right. And it hasn't all been Cubs way so far against the Cardinals. No, they, they've played them five times this season. They're two and three so far this season. They lost two or three in their first series against the Redbirds at Wrigley, in which Wilson Contreras had a great series and encouraged the boos. So if you find yourself heading to Wrigley Field, do not boo Wilson Contreras. He thrives on that. Please just ignore him. <laughs> um, as everybody knows, they split two in London. The Cubs took game one, nine to one in a drubbing, but... St. Louis took the second game 7-5 to five, when Stroman had to leave because of a blister and Trey Mancini made a key error that opened the door for the Cardinals. Well, speaking of Marcus Stroman, he's going to get a little uh, revenge act and hopefully not his uh, last start at Wrigley Field as a Cub. He throws uh, later on tonight. Yes, Marcus Stroman, 10-6, 288, forces left-handed pitcher Steven Matz 0-7 oh, with a 486 ERA. Stroman's pitched in two games against the Cardinals. He pitched the first game in May. Remember, he struggled getting run support. He went six innings and gave up two runs on four hits to take the loss. He pitched the second game in the London series. He only went 3.1 innings, gave up six runs, only three of them earned, and left the game with the blister injury. Um, but but Marcus had a, had a good start coming out of uh, the break, which is what we were really looking for as he struggled uh, a little bit before the All Star break in the last versus Boston, he went six innings pitch, gave up only one earned run, three hits, so that was really good. Whereas before the All Star break, he struggled against Milwaukee and Cleveland. So, you know, look, you know, just looking for Marcus to continue, like you said, you know, it doesn't seem like the talk of of you know a possible trade is really affecting. It seems like he's kind of got his you know, his, his wits about him and, and he knows the business, right? He knows this right. is, this is what it's about. And so this is not, do, uh, this is not Marcus Stroman's first rodeo. No. So all you can do is go out and pitch as well as you can, but some guy, someone that isn't pitching well is Steven Matz, 32 years old. Um, you know, he, he's a lefty Owen seven against Washington, the same nationals, the Cubs played, he went 4.1 innings, gave up four earned runs, had a good game against the white Sox, 5.1 innings and gave up no runs. And then in Miami, he only went 2.1 innings and gave up two earned runs. So this is definitely one that, uh, you know, as far as when you look at it on paper, you're saying to yourself, this is one that the Cubs need to win. Yes, need to win it indeed. Let's hope that trend continues for Steven Matz. All right, game two will be on Friday, and it will be a day game as the rest of the series will be day games. Uh, We got uh, the all-star Justin Steele throwing. Yeah, Justin Steele, you, you know, you, uh, he, like I said, he has uh, faced the Cardinals a couple times this season. Um, the first time in May, he pitched six innings, gave up three runs on seven hits, and then he pitched the first game in the London series. He shut down the Cardinals uh, going six innings, giving up one run on five hits. Now, the Cubs saw Jack Flaherty in May. He pitched against Drew Smiley. He went five innings and gave up three runs on seven hits. So as far as, as Steele, you know, he the all-star against Boston, he really, really struggled 
Uh, he gave up six, uh, I'm sorry, six earned runs on 10 hits through six innings. So rough game for Steele. And then before the all-star break, he pitched really well against Miami. Uh, he went six innings, gave up only three runs. And against Cleveland, he went 6.1 innings and he gave up no earned runs. So like Kyle Hendricks, you would love to see Steele bounce back um, against the Cardinals. Now yeah, he had a little bit of a bad luck, I felt too. Right, right. There was a little bit of bad luck, you know, basket shots like we've been talking about. Um, Jack Flaherty. Nico, Nico Horner error that won't happen again. Right. Uh, as far as Jack Flaherty is concerned, you know, right now this season, he's doing okay. He's seven and five with the 429 ERA. Uh, last game against Washington, six innings, gave up three earned runs. He did really well versus, before the All Star break. He pitched over six. He pitched six innings again, six point two against Miami, and six innings against the Yankees. And he pitched two shutouts. So uh, you know, let's let's hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> let's hope. Fingers crossed, as I like to say. Now, what we have are the probables. So you know, as far as it goes, uh, if, if you're looking, we have prob- yeah, we got a lot of TBD. Is what we got. That's right from the horse's mouth. We know right. who should. We know who should be throwing based on based on days off. Um, the 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 game three. Go ahead, Crawley. It's supposed hasn't to, been it's announced supposed, just right, yet. But but who should it? But who should it be? Right. So as we're kind of looking at this, this would be Drew Smiley's turn in the rotation versus Miles Michaelis. Smiley has not faced the Cardinals this season. Michaelis pitched one game against the Cubs in May. He only went four point innings, but he gave up four hits on one run ball. We've talked about the disaster Drew Smiley has been lately. The, the last few starts have just been atrocious, and he is somebody that the Cubs desperately need um, to figure things out. Uh, every start has been not a lot. I mean, he went six innings against uh, the Nationals this last time, but gave up five runs. But what you've been getting from him lately is less than five innings of work and roughly about three to four runs, uh, really hurting the bullpen. And so he, you know, I'm glad that he was able to get a little length this t- last time out, but now you got to stop with giving up all the earned runs. How about a little Hayden Wesnisky action potentially? Potentially Hayden Wesnisky, uh, Ben Brown, Caleb Killian. Those, they're, they're, these are all guys that are knocking on the door. Uh, uh, I don't know about Caleb Killian. That, that, uh, don't that do is. not just do not give up on him. That's all. I'm, I'm not giving. Up, I'm not giving up on him. I just don't know that I want him in Game Three against the Cardinals with so much on the line. I guess is my point. Yeah, you, you, like I said, these guys, they go through the changes in, in the minor leagues. They're working on things. We don't know what to expect, so it's hard to extrapolate what he did. Yeah. Or, is Drew Smiley, or is Drew Smiley getting traded before Saturday? Don't know. That's why it makes right. it interesting another, that another, all, yeah, those, right. all those mm-hmm. TBDs. Right. But Miles Michaelis always seems to give the Cubs fits. He's not having the greatest season for him as far as he is concerned. Six and five with a 414 ERA. Against Miami, he went six innings, gave up three earned runs. But another guy who was really good before the break where he, you know, with Washington, he went three innings, gave up zero runs. And then against the White Sox, he went seven innings and giving gave up zero runs. So it's really been the Cardinals pitching that has kind of uh, propelled them as far as what's been going on with their recent hot streak. Absolutely right. So uh, we'll see what happens in game number three. The wrap-up is Sunday. It's supposed to be JMO. But. JMO three and again TBD is what we see three and six with the 605 ERA versus Jordan Montgomery six and seven with the 314 ERA. Uh, Tyone pitched against the Cardinals in the series in May and only went 2.2 innings, giving up four runs on five hits. It was not good. Jordan Montgomery had the unlucky task of having to face Steele in May. He went five innings and gave up six runs on seven hits. So again. Tyone, decent start against Nationals. 5.2 innings, gave up seven hits, three earned runs. Against the Yankees, he had a phenomenal start. Eight innings, one hit, zero earned runs. So hopefully, this is the time where you see uh, Jamison Tyone turn it around and be the pitcher that he's been for most of his career. Let's hope. Again, fingers crossed, maybe on both hands. All right, Crowley, who's hot, who's not? Cardinals, Cubs. Uh, before we get there, the, the Cardinals are throwing Jordan Montgomery. He is 6-7. and seven. He's got a good ERA, 314 ERA. Again, another guy who's been doing really well lately. Six innings against Miami, his last start. One, uh, one earned run. Against the White Sox, 4.1 innings, one earned run. And against the Yankees, he went 6.2, and he gave up zero earned runs. So the Cubs hitting uh, definitely has their work cut out for them. Yeah, those are good statistics from Jordan Montgomery, who's set to throw against the Cubs at Wrigley on Sunday. All right, now who's hot and who's not? 
Well, there's no doubt as far as the hot is concerned. You can't get much hotter than Cody Bellinger. The guy is 10 hits for his last 23 with three home run and six RBIs, slashing 435, 480, 870 slug. I mean, wow, unreal. And, and, and so when you take a look also at Mike Talkman, he is seven for his last 15 with a home run and eight RBIs, 467, 579, 867. I don't want the Cubs to sell. Let me just say that in the right here, right now. But at the same time, if you are selling, it's good to have a couple guys on the that that are trade chips getting hot at this time. Yeah, they arguably have two or three of the top five uh, potential tradable assets. Do the Cubs? All right, how about the not? The not. Um, when we take a look at the not, we talked a little bit about Ian Happ. As far as Ian Happ is concerned, he's struggling a little bit. Uh, that's an understatement. He's struggling a lot. Five for his last 22. He did get that home run the other day in three RBIs, but he's slashing 227, 320, and 409. Also struggling a little bit. Uh, Jan Gomes is three for his last 13, slashing 231, 339, 231. But again, any offense you get from Jan Gomes is just a bonus, you know? How about how about first base? Could, could we put first base? I know that's not a player, but who's ever in first base for the Cubs right now seems to struggle. Yeah, that doesn't matter who it is. Right now, Trey Mancini has the most at bats. He's struggling three for his last 15. Uh, he's slashing 200, 250, 200. It's just been that black hole ever since Rizzo has left. Matt Mervis alert. Matt Mervis alert. I think it's time to bring it back up, Crowley. Uh, Sahadev Sharma had an interesting article about Matt Mervis. Um, here's the thing. This is very similar to when everyone was freaking out about Christopher Morell. Um, from his first time up, they saw what the way that they were attacking him. They saw the holes... Uh, that, that, that they were exposing and they're not going to bring him up until he is a hundred percent ready. They're worried. They're, they're focused on his career development. And if they think that the, he's going to struggle by coming up, if he's not hundred percent ready, I know he's working with John Maley on some things. When he comes up, the goal is he never goes back. All right. Let's talk about the Cardinals. Unfortunately, who's hot for them and who's not for them. Well, the Cardinals make it easy for me because both of the guys that are hot are named Nolan. Oh. Uh, Nolan Gorman is, you know, the second baseman. He's nine for his last 22 with two home runs and nine RBIs slashing 409, 435 and 818. Uh, Nolan Arenado is eight for his last 22 with two home runs and 10 RBIs. He's slashing 364, 407 and 682. I want to put a name out there for our listeners to kind of just put in the back of your head is that the Cardinals sometimes dig up these players out of nowhere, the Lars Newt bars of the world. I was just going to um, ask, where's Lars Newt bar? He is not having the greatest of seasons this year, but a guy to kind of pay attention to is Ivan Herrera. He's a catcher and he is right now, he hasn't have a lot of bats for uh, nine at bats, but in the last seven days, but he has four hits in those nine at bats. But he's a guy that, that they are, there's, there's a couple different catchers in the mix. You know about Wilson Contreras. He's on our not list right now. He's two for his last 11 with one home run and one RBI. He's slashing 182, 250, 455. But the Cardinals right now are electing to go with three catchers. Ivan Herrera is one of them. Um, the other is Andrew Kinzer and then Wilson. But, it, you know, Wilson's right now in his last seven games only has 11 at bats. When you talk about seven at games, you're talking about 23, 24 at bats. So you could see, you know, they're, they're kind of, he's getting less and less at bats. So very curious to see what happens to that situation. Um, the other not is Dylan Carlson. He's two for his last 12 with one RBI slash 167, 375, 250. Uh, and then if you're wondering about Paul Goldschmidt, always creeping around seven for his last 25 with a home run and three RBIs. 280, 379, 440, which are still good numbers, but say so that might make the hot list for the Cubs. <laughs> right. And uh, definitely. Course. And definitely at first base. And, and and don't forget, he loves hitting at Wrigley. So we'll see what happens. We will indeed. All right. Time for the prediction, Crawley. The Cubs took two out of three from the Nationals. They needed that. They need these games against the Cardinals. They've got four of them. How do you see it going? Oh boy. I'm you know what my, my theory on four game series is always the split. I know, but, right. but again, and I said this, remember right when they played Milwaukee, right. You know, in July is that all splits give you right now is they just burn days off the calendar. You can't do it. You, you need to win series, even these crummy four game series. So I'm hoping, but you know, the Cardinals, like I said, very hot right now. Hopefully the, 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 the nationals provided the Cubs with what they needed as far as getting the offense 
jump started and the pitching can do enough to keep the Cardinals down. Three of the Cubs' best pitchers are in this series, and arguably their two best are starting this thing off on Thursday and Friday with Stroman and Steele. We don't know about Saturday, even though I'm going to predict it's Hayden Wisniewski, and I'm going to hope that Jamison Tyone can uh, at least give us five and a third and you know, no home runs and limit the walks and maybe five Ks. I'm going to go with three out of four because this team needs to do this right now. I love it. I love it when you're the positive one, Dustin. That's a wrap. Don't forget to listen, download, review, most importantly, subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. Follow the socials, Fly the W on Facebook and Instagram. Email us, flythew670 at gmail.com. And now you can watch us on YouTube by subscribing to the 670 The Score YouTube channel. Crowley, enjoy the games. Enjoy Pat Hughes as he goes into Cooperstown. We'll be talking about that and the uh, Cardinals next week. Plus... Tuesday, Wednesday, we got the Cubs Sox crosstown rivalry. There's nothing better than beating the Cardinals at Wrigley Field. Go Cubs! Hey guys, it's Crawley. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Go Cubs!